What's up guys? So we had a lot of people reach out to us on Instagram and YouTube comments and all over the place about our electrical setup. So this is something we invested a lot of time into researching during our build. So we thought it'd be great to create an educational resource for y'all to check out and walk you through what we did, kind of educate a little bit on how electrical systems in a bus might work uh, and really just share that information with you. While I look through YouTube and look at other people's videos, I've noticed that a lot of people are giving a great walkthrough of how their system works but it's lacking that background education on what these components actually are, what they actually do, and what are the differences. Uh, so we're gonna cover that in, in our content, and we're going to split this into two different videos for you. Today, we're gonna cover the definition. In our next video, you're gonna watch actual walkthrough of our solar system, how we built it, what's working for us, what's not. To be honest, it's mostly working for us. Uh, and really just give you a well-rounded point of view of how these systems work. So to make sure you get to watch that second video of the electrical walkthrough, subscribe to our channel. That way you get a notification when we post that next week. Now disclaimer, I'm by no means an electrician or an electrical expert, but I did do a lot of research when looking into this electrical system. It's probably the area of our build that I spent the most time just figuring out how to make it work right. Now we've been living on the year, on the road for just about a year now, and this has worked fantastically for us. So let's dive in. So let's start with monocrystalline solar panels and polycrystalline solar panels. To make it easier to say, I'm gonna say mono for monocrystalline and poly for polycrystalline. Now let's start with how to tell the difference just by looking at them. Monocrystalline, which is what we have here, are gonna be more of a black tint to them. Poly are actually gonna have a bluish hue to them. So if you look at the solar panels online and you're not sure or it doesn't say quickly in the description what they are, mono, black, poly, bluish hue. So aside from color, there's two other main differences between mono and poly solar panels. The first is efficiency. Now mono are more efficient. They're about 20% more efficient. So get, to give an example of how that would work, we have 175 watt monocrystalline solar panels behind us. If these were poly solar panels in the exact same size, meaning the space that they're taking up on our roof, they'd be approximately 140 watts. So again, mono are more efficient and poly are a little less efficient. The third main difference between these two types of solar panels is cost. So mono being the more premium, more efficient solar panel is also going to be more expensive. Poly being a little less efficient, it's actually going to be a lot cheaper. Uh, I don't know if I'd say a lot, but it is going to be cheaper. So if efficiency is your main driver, then you might want to go with mono. If cost is your main driver, on the other hand, then you might be fine going with poly. Ultimately, it's your decision. There's nothing wrong with either of these solar panels, and they can both work great for you. So next up are solar charge controllers. Solar charge controllers control the flow of electricity from your solar panels, into your batteries. Now this is very important because your batteries need to be charged in stages at the proper voltage. And that's what these are gonna control. Now there's two types of these solar charge controllers. There's MPPT, or multiple power point tracking, and PWM, or pulse width modulation. MPPT is the newer, more efficient charge controller technology. This is what we have. We have a 40 amp MPPT rich solar charge controller. If you want to find our exact charge controller, navigate down to the description and we have a link that'll bring you right there to Rich Solar's website to see which one we have and purchase if you'd like. Now MPPT versus PWM, they are more efficient and they're going to perform better in cloudy conditions. PWM are a little older technology but can still be great charge controllers. Uh, they are less efficient than MPPT or less expensive, so that's one benefit to a PWM charge controller. Because they're older technology, they're actually less complex, so they might have a slightly less chance of having any technical issues in the future. Either one of these charge controllers are going to be great for you. Moving into our electrical cabinet, we're gonna go over inverters, but with inverters, I'm gonna pair in two other pieces. And the reason I'm gonna do that is depending on which product you might buy, these might, all three of these might be one piece. So that's an inverter charger, which would also include a transfer switch. So the three pieces that we'll be talking through is an inverter, a battery charger, and a transfer switch. Now the inverter, the main thing you need to understand, to understand its entire point, is the difference between AC and DC power. Edison versus Tesla, right? So, your batteries are storing the power in DC. 
Now, when you use it, most household appliances are going to be in AC. In order to make that transition, the inverter is going to transfer that energy from the DC power stored in the batteries to AC power that your toaster will be using. So that's the point of the inverter here. Next up, you have your battery charger and you have your transfer switch. Now, really, these only matter if you plan to have shore power. Shore power is simply just plugging your bus or your rig right into an outlet. So this is a 30 amp outlet. You could have 15 amp shore power or you could have 50 amp shore power. We'll go into that more in depth in our next video. But again, shore power is just plugging your bus in to charge your batteries and use the power directly from an external power source like an outlet. So much like the solar charge controller, the battery charger is going to charge your batteries in stages when you're connected to shore power. The transfer switch is a pretty cool tool that when you're plugged into shore power, it's going to sense that current coming in and it's going to block out the outbound power from the batteries and only use the power that you're plugged into. That means when you're plugged into shore power, your batteries aren't being discharged at all. They're only being charged with the excess power that you aren't using and they're sitting isolated from all the other power you're consuming. Now the exception to this is whatever pieces of your build are in DC power. So we, for instance, we have DC lights. Our LED lights are powered from DC. So those are still gonna come from the batteries. But any AC power you consume while attached to shore power with the transfer switch is going to come straight from the plug rather than your batteries. Now again, as we're sitting here in the electrical cabinet, remember to subscribe to our channel because next week we're gonna go into this entire cabinet and walk through wire gauges, fuses, and how this entire system is interacting with each other and how it's wired to help you set up your system. So let's talk batteries. Now there's many different types of deep cycle batteries and deep cycle batteries are what you're gonna be using for your house batteries in your electrical system. The three main types that are used in conversions are AGM, gel, and lithium. I'm really only gonna dive into AGM and lithium because from everybody I've talked to, everybody I've met and what I've seen online, it seems like those are the two primary battery types that people are using in buses and bus and van conversions. Now there's no secret that lithium are the premium batteries. Uh, if you do any research online, that's gonna become very obvious, but it can be a little confusing what are the actual differences. So what I'm gonna do is give you a good breakdown between an, two different equivalent batteries of lithium versus AGM batteries. Now lithium, for lithium, we're gonna use a 100 amp hour Renogy battery. For AGM, we're actually going to use a 200 amp hour Renogy battery. I'll explain why right now. So one of the main benefits of a lithium battery is you can discharge them to almost 0%. AGM batteries, you're only supposed to discharge to about 50% of what the battery can hold. Meaning a 200 amp hour battery, you can use 100 amp hours of that battery before you should stop and recharge it versus a lithium 100 amp hour battery, you can discharge to almost zero amp hours. Now some recommend only discharging 80%, but in theory you can. Now as you can see, the 100 amp hour Renogy lithium ion battery goes for approximately $900, and then the 200 amp hour Renogy AGM battery goes for $400. Wow, what a cost difference for using 100 amp hours of battery. Uh, for comparison, I'm going to call it usable amp hours. That's $9 per amp hour, usable amp hours for lithium, and $4 per usable amp, amp hour for AGM. Now, again, lithium are also more efficient. They're overall just the better battery. One other main difference is the weight. So a 200 amp hour AGM battery is gonna weigh a whopping 130 pounds. This is what we have, they're friggin' heavy. A 100 amp hour Renogy lithium battery is only 26 pounds. So we're talking the difference of 130 pounds to 26 pounds, that's gonna add up. Now what you're technically doing in order to pull power from your engine into your batteries is connecting your house batteries to your bus batteries, so your starting batteries. Now, when the charger engages to charge your house batteries, it's actually pulling power from your ba bus batteries. So that's gonna tell the alternator to spin up bigger and provide more power. Then you're charging both batteries and keeping all the electrical in the bus going. 
Now, the difference between these two, the battery, again, the battery isolator and the DC to DC charger, is a battery isolator is a little more simple and much less expensive, but that can also come at a cost. The commonality between these two is that they isolate your house batteries from your bus batteries when the power's off, meaning your bus batteries aren't going to be discharging to your house batteries while the bus is off. That's super important because otherwise you're gonna be making a smoothie, pulling power from your house batteries, also pulling power from your bus batteries, then you go to start the bus and she's not gonna start. So again, the whole isolator aspect is breaking those apart while the bus isn't on. Now, the big benefit of having a DC to DC charger is that you're gonna charge in stages. Just like when we talked about before, your battery charger from shore power or your solar charger for pulling in power from your solar panels, you wanna charge your batteries, your house batteries in stages to ensure long life and longevity. So what's gonna keep your entire electrical setup safe? What's gonna keep it from just bursting into flames? Well, that's fuses and gauges. Gauges are to wire, and then fuses connect the wires in between components. Ultimately, all they're doing is monitoring or keeping safe how hot something can get. So the difference gauge of the wire determines how much electrical current or how much heat it can safely handle and transmit. The fuse is what goes somewhere in between the system that determines, okay, if too much current is going through or if this is getting too hot, pop so that it breaks the flow of electricity and keeps all of your components safe and prohibits the fire from starting. So on the other end of the system is distributing that power and protecting that to make sure it's safe. So on the AC side, you have a breaker box. On the DC side, you have a fuse box. Now these are basically going to trip or blow if you're trying to consume more power than this can safely put out, which again is gonna generate heat and potentially cause a disaster. So, the AC box, you have your fuses, that means if you're plugged into that outlet and you're trying to draw too much power, it's going to pop just to keep you safe. The fuse box on the other side, DC power, if whatever electrical line is connected to that fuse is trying to draw too much power, it's also going to pop to prohibit the fire from starting. Now, we'll dive deeper into each of these in next week's video. So that covers all of the major components for your off-grid electrical system. Now remember, next week, we're gonna walk through thoroughly our entire off-grid electrical system, each component, and how they interact with each other. Make sure you subscribe so you get a notification when we post that video. Lastly, and in the meantime, comment and like on this video. Any questions you have, comments, thoughts, tell us what you think, and tune in next week. Cheers.